education. So Rights and Democracy, which we call RAD for short, was founded in 2015 on the theory of change that it takes people power year after year to make the kind of big, bold, long-term changes that we want to see in this country. Part of this theory of change is that it takes political infrastructure, in this case a membership organization, to sustain the momentum necessary to do that work throughout and in between elections. RAD members and staff work on issues that matter to our communities, organize for policy change at the state and national level, and recruit and train a pipeline of progressive candidates to run for office. Our members are from all walks of life intergenerational, multicultural, activists, artists, organizers, but most importantly, passionate fighters for true social justice and meaningful change in our communities and across the state. We have chapters all over Vermont and as well as in New Hampshire, so look for us wherever you are. All of this is in pursuit of a government that works for all of us, reflects us, and is responsive to our needs. RAD is a membership organization for all of us, and I hope that you will join us if you're not already a member so that we can continue to grow this movement to win. You can find us on the web at radvt.org, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and on YouTube. So tonight, we have an important topic. There is not an individual that's on this call whose lives have not been affected by the novel coronavirus. Vermonters are struggling to survive this moment in more ways than we might imagine. Your pain is real, your fears are real, your concerns are real. Your hope and endurance for a different tomorrow is also real. So tonight's conversation is about where we go from here. And we're fortunate to have Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman, Speaker of the House Mitzi Johnson, and President Pro Tempore Tim Ash to join us here tonight to share important information about what solutions are underway on the state level and their visions for what must change. We're also deeply fortunate to have the voices of leaders from the front lines of this crisis to share their concerns and ask crucial questions for us to consider. Tonight, our event will include brief remarks from each of the panelists, followed by a facilitated question and answer portion of the event. Now, in an attempt to minimize disruptions, everyone on the call will be muted and will be unable to unmute. So this means that there actually may be a pause between speakers as our moderator unmutes the next speaker that's come up. We have an incredible lineup of guests today, so we will not be taking questions from the audience, but we'll do our best to know any that appear in the chat. We are recording this event and we'll post it to YouTube and Facebook later this week. Now, I would like to welcome two incredible leaders with rights and democracy, Tanya Wojcicki and Jubilee McGill, who will facilitate tonight's conversation and share stories about the mutual aid community response work that they are leading in response to COVID-19. Tanya and Jubilee, welcome. Thank you, Kaya. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jubilee McGill. I'm from Bridport. I started um, kind of at the beginning as a timid RAD event attendee, um, and then it became a member, and then a member leader, and recently I joined staff as an organizer in Addison County. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a lot of internal discussion about how we could continue our mission and stay true to our values in this time. And so a lot of us, our work plans changed to allow us to help build and support mutual aid efforts in our communities. So one weekend early on, I just holed away and I built a website and Google Forms to connect people in Addison County who could help with people who had needs. This quickly grew and became a network in my county with well over 400 volunteers and we have point people to cover all towns. Uh, we've developed strong connections to our area service providers um, and we've even developed a partnership with our local United Way. Um, and so they operate, operate a fund that provides grants to fill in financially when people fall into the cracks of our current systems. For example, we were able to help a newly divorced mother get a grant to cover childcare. In order to work at her job at our local hospital, she needed childcare. But in order to pay for the childcare, she needed to work. This grant allowed her a couple of weeks to get on her feet and her children were in a healthy, safe environment while she could not be at home with them. 
In doing this work and talking with many others throughout the state, common trends in the stories were quickly apparent. Names and locations may be different, but the experiences felt by so many in Vermont are very much the same. We also noticed that these same experiences were usually the result of cracks in our current systems and procedures. So while these mutual aid efforts have been amazing and so important in these times, we also began to question why they needed to exist. And so with that, I would like to introduce Tanya Vihovsky. Tanya is a force. Um, she is a longtime member leader with RAD. She is a fierce activist and justice seeker, and she is also a candidate for Vermont State Representative in Essex. Thanks, Jubilee. Jubilee's story shows the real power of mutual aid and community organizing, and I'm so grateful and proud to be doing similar organizing here in Essex, where I live. I want to tell a different way that that story has played out, though. The story of a single parent with a chronic health condition whose young kids are now learning from home, who barely gets by in a good week, and now their hours have been reduced, and while they're trying to do the limited work available virtually and homeschool their kids, and find work because they're one of the more than 50% of Vermonters that lives paycheck to paycheck and can't afford their bills without their full wages, let alone the additional cost of childcare because they're not deemed essential and can't ac access the childcare supports Jubilee mentioned. They've not been able to get through to unemployment and cannot possibly spend the hours on the phone needed to figure that system out. And so they haven't been paid their full wages in over six weeks. The stress level in this home is unimaginable. And that's when they reach out to mutual aid for help. And we work hard to get food delivered from the school and volunteers to deliver from the food shelf. And a couple of volunteers who are able to video chat with their kids and entertain them for an hour or two here and there. We're even able to connect them to a one-time grant that helps them right now. And it's great, they won't be evicted now. Their utilities won't be turned off now. But what about when this is all over and the nice volunteers go back to work? when the eviction and utility shut off moratoriums end and this family has accumulated months of expenses that they cannot possibly pay back and their job as they knew it no longer exists. What then? We're here to talk about a people's bailout because this is bigger than heartwarming mutual aid stories, eviction moratoriums and one-off $1,200 payments. We have a society where the majority live on the edge and this crisis has laid that bare. We cannot simply go back to normal. Sure, some of us will have that privilege, but we can't forget about the many who don't. That for those whom when this is over, their lives will be in pieces. We have to ensure that right now, our government is making sure their needs are met. And that as the immediate danger subsides, we fight with all of our might to build a society that doesn't leave so many at the margins, margins and falling through the cracks. Some of us will never be able to go back to normal and none of us ever should because normal allowed for that story and many others across our communities that look just like it. And while it is wonderful, and I'm so proud to be part of the mutual aid network in my community, and that they are springing up all over the state to meet some of these needs, we can never meet all of the needs. And the organization of these mutual aid efforts will fade as the danger passes. And then what? With that, I'd like to introduce our Lieutenant Governor, David Zuckerman to introduce himself and speak a little bit about what he has been doing. Uh, thank you, uh, all three of you, uh, Kaya, Jubilee, and Tanya for uh, the opening here, as well as the other folks running the show. I know that um, uh, Shay is behind the scenes making sure you can hear us and, and Franzi and others. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I also wanna actually give a, a brief shout out to both uh, Senator Ash and Speaker Johnson, and there's a few other reps I see on this, uh, just on my own screen, uh, Mari Cordes, Bill Knott, and uh, Mary Howard, there may be others. Uh, the effort that so many of you are doing, whether they're mutual aid groups, as we just talked about by citizens across the state, um, but also the incredible hours that these representatives and others are putting in, hearing many of those exact phone calls and stories and challenges that Vermonters are facing, particularly getting through to the UI system, um, but as a whole, just struggling to find out what's going on, what are people supposed to do? Uh, these folks are doing 12 and 14 hour days uh, pretty much every day. Um, and, uh, and I'm aware of many of the calls they're getting because I'm getting them too, but I'm not writing the policy and trying to get that uh, coordinated the way that uh, 
Pro Tem Ash and Speaker Johnson are. I'll say quickly, um, this uh, coronavirus crisis has done exactly what uh, was just introduced and said. It has revealed how truly uh, unjust and problematic uh, our economic system is. You know, the economy has supposedly been really good for one of the longest stretches in history, uh, and yet half of the folks are living paycheck to paycheck. And we learn, obviously, with this kind of shutdown or if there was a weather event that could have done some of these kinds of uh, challenges for people and isolating folks, uh, how fragile the economy really is for more than half of our population. And I was on a call earlier today with some youth who were talking about um, some friends of theirs. One was a young uh, trans male who was talking about a friend who is housed with family members that are not um, supportive of that youth's situation and how they are isolated, uh, depressed, potentially suicidal, and, um, and they're incredibly isolated. So we already weren't necessarily uh, providing enough supports in the society for young people who are going through those kinds of crises or members of community of color that are getting disproportionately affected in our schools. And now we have this incredible inequality of revealed not only of those kinds of issues, but then broadband and education. You know, I've been thinking about the Brigham decision that led to Act 60 that talked about equal education. And right now we have a quarter to a third of the kids in Vermont uh, with such slow bandwidth or no bandwidth or no screen to learn from, uh, not even getting an education. Uh, so there's a lot of reveals, I guess, that the coronavirus has uh, exposed. Um, and right now, you know, these legislative leaders are doing an amazing job, frankly, of trying to pull together uh, triage legislation to uh, open doors and reduce regulatory hurdles and make things flow more quickly. Uh, but uh, I do think the broader conversation is out of this, what do we want to create? And how do we create it? Which policies like minimum wage and paid family leave that were attempted and the governor vetoed now will actually have new life going forward with a real possibility for folks in rights and democracy and others to organize to say, this is what we were talking about. If you had three or five weeks of paid family leave, the unemployment process wouldn't, uh, its delay and problems would not have led to nearly as many desperate people as the phone calls that I know every representative and I have been getting. Um, and it's really been an interesting conversation for me with folks who are a little better off, who aren't living paycheck to paycheck, overall feeling like, you know, this is uncomfortable, it's disruptive, but things are going pretty well. Uh, we haven't had a massive, you know, kinds of surge in hospital uh, situation and in death. We've certainly had some, some very sad losses. Um, any death is a sad loss, but they're sort of more comfortable and they're like, okay, it's a uncomfortable stay home situation, but things are going okay. And then there's this whole other population, which is literally, you know, 100,000 plus Vermonters who I'm getting calls from saying, the system's broken. I'm out of food. My kids are getting a couple meals a day because of the schools, thank goodness. Um, but I didn't even have anything like toast even for breakfast. When is this going to get fixed? Uh, and so I've been trying uh, to reach the, the commissioner of the Department of Labor. I talked with him once a couple weeks ago after I sent them a letter saying, put three or 400 guard members on computers, on the phones to get folks processed. Just get them a check. We can square up later. Uh, and he said, when I talked to him, the letter was Wednesday. I talked to him Thursday morning. He said, we can't do that because of federal regulations. We're going to jeopardize our money. And Friday, the governor said, we're going to write $1,200 checks to everybody who's gotten into the system. It was still an issue because many people hadn't gotten through. And now we're seeing the, uh, the independent contractors and self-employed folks not getting through. And they're saying, we're going to go back to work. I can't okay. live with no money. Thank you, David. Yeah, sorry. We're I'm there. Not. We'll have more time so to many other things. Wait. We'll I know. Back yes, Thank you, we Julie. need several hours. You got um, it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so up next, uh, please welcome Speaker of the House, Mitzi Johnson.
think I'm muted. There we go. Uh, unmuted now. Hello, everybody. Uh, really glad you could all join us. Um, glad to see a bunch of house members on here as well. And want to thank Kaya Morris for the invite and happy to see you again right now. Um, it, it has been uh, really an incredible, um, just wild eye-opening ride in the last in the last six weeks, trying to figure out um, really how to how to keep Vermonters safe, how to get Vermonters uh, their basic needs, and and how to how can we as a legislature, as a co-equal branch of government. Um, do our jobs, support Vermonters, be responsive to Vermonters' needs in a very open but physically remote way. Um, so there have been a lot of intense conversations in trying to um, in trying to make sure that we have ways that we can do that. I think I think once we are through this, there will be a lot of terrific conversations to be had about what are the experiments that we've run during this time that we want to continue. You know. In order to keep an eye on your government before all of this, you had to have childcare or elder care. You had to have a working car. You had to have a day off from work or a, or a time that you could drive a few hours to find a parking place in Montpelier to, um, to try to squeeze in as one of the 10 to 30 people in a committee room. Um, and now you can log onto YouTube um, if you have access to to the internet and to some sort of computer or smartphone that will let you do that. So I think we've made major strides that I look forward to really looking at uh, when we get through this at how we can how we can keep some of these things in place to make sure that our democracy democracy is accessible as possible. Um, when this all began, our top priority was was health. You know, right now I feel like I'm really really deep in in UI, in people's income, and in higher education in the future of VSC. But, um, you know, but, but a month ago, six weeks ago, we were all worried about the surge and if we were gonna have enough ventilators and if we were gonna have enough healthcare facilities. Um, and, uh, and so that was our first priority to create flexibility and provide supports for our healthcare system. And because Vermonters stepped up, paid attention and and for the most part, respected some of the stay at home and the social distancing, we were really able to turn that curve, um, which has, has helped all of us tremendously. Uh, the biggest concern right now on the table is, is that Vermonters have been without income for six weeks. Um, you know, I hear a few good news stories here and there of people who have been able to file for unemployment. Uh, a friend just texted today saying, saying she did the self-employment form online and it went really smooth, uh, but, but we are hearing from a lot of people that are calling hundreds and hundreds of times a day. And um, I have been trying to talk with the, you know, the commissioner saying, look, let legislators do their jobs. Let, let us be that conduit between, between our communities and state government, which, which we are hired by our communities to do. We're elected for that job. Um, and uh, I haven't gotten anywhere. And so this weekend I just texted the governor and said, we're putting in place a system so that reps are gonna collect data, legislators are gonna collect data, and we're gonna send it to these couple of people at the Department of Labor so that you can fix these problems for people that have been without income for six weeks. Let me know if you want me to send it to somebody differently. And we were able to really have a good, very productive conversation with the governor's office. Um, that system went live. Hopefully many of you have seen that on Facebook and I know there are a lot of legislators that are madly typing in entries of their constituents that have had significant problems. And some of them are as simple as needing a pin reset, but when you can't get through on the phone, that's impossible. So I hope that, I hope that we've provided one more tool to get through. Um, I've also volunteered house members to help in any way. And so there are a, a solid handful of house members that have stepped forward to say, sure, if I can be of help at DOL to help process claims, we can do that. Because, um, because as, as some of you pointed out earlier, when folks live paycheck to paycheck, going without a check for six weeks puts people in very dire situations. Um, so that is, that is our main focus right now, is really trying to get through those things, get money into Vermonters' pockets, 
um, and and really look at different ways to um, you know to increase that income to um, to just have any sort of income. And I know the uh, the Senate has been working on a really interesting proposal, which I'll leave to Senator Ash to explain. Um, Thank you, Mitzi. I will wrap up there. Thanks. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Um, I would next like to introduce Senate pro tem Tim Ash um, to speak some about what is happening on the Senate side. All right, thank you, Tanya. Thanks, everybody. Um, quick uh, background for those of you who don't know me, my original roots coming out of college were working for Bernie. Then I was at uh, CVOEO, which is Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, used to be housed above the uh, original or former Vermont Workers Center office. And, um, then was working for Cathedral Square, which I know some of the faces that I've, uh, the participant list, I've seen some of my former Cathedral Square compadres uh, are actually on the call here. So um, this, you know, I'll, I'll reiterate something that uh, David said and uh, that Mitzi also uh, referenced, which is working together has been, I think one of the things, whether it's been at the local mutual aid level or in the legislative uh, branch, has been one of the silver linings of this whole experience, seeing people rally to try to tackle common objectives rather than focus on all the things that um, we might differ on. So uh, both David and Mitzi have been uh, wonderful to work with, which has helped us be uh, flexible, both for meeting constituent needs, which has been just, I've never experienced anything like the last six weeks in that regard, but being able to move so quickly with the uh, eviction uh, foreclosure moratorium, uh, quickly moving to allow unemployment eligibility for people who don't believe it's safe for them to be at work, either because they might be at risk or they might bring it home to a family member. Um, those are the kinds of things that we stepped up right away because we knew that meeting people's human needs, health needs, basic needs were the absolute priority. Um, I'll, Briefly touch on uh, something the speaker just referenced, which we're working on in the Senate, but in collaboration with House partners, which is uh, the issue of an essential worker pay bump. One of the things I hope we all take away from this, and I suspect, I just suspect that folks who would be participating in a rights and democracy call probably don't need to be encouraged to think this way, but I hope that the broader public has a new appreciation for the term essential worker and what that really means. Typically, when we think of moments of crisis like this, and in my lifetime, this, this and September 11th really are the two most significant public crises of my life. I hope I'm not missing something because, you know, these are long days. But typically, we think of firefighters, police, first responders, medical professionals, and it's appropriate that we think of them as essential workers now and every time. But we're also seeing that people who show up for work every day in jobs that are not glamorous, that get paid like dirt, who are underappreciated, treated like they're invisible, well, suddenly people think of them as essential. Shut down the grocery store, we'll find out how valuable those people are really quick. So we're starting to hear a lot of people recognize the inherent value and worth of people who are custodians, people who are in frontline retail, delivery people, all of these jobs that, that generally get no notice uh, whatsoever, uh, there's a new appreciation for it. My hope is that when we're past this thing, that people don't go back to the old way of thinking and say, okay, it's still cool for them to make $10.96 an hour. You know, that, that I'm hopeful we will not uh, face a repeat of. Uh, a few things that have been particularly challenging in this moment, um, I, I see Linda and some others from the state college system. Uh, it seems like a million years ago, but it was just nine days ago that uh, the chancellor of the state college system announced that he hoped that the board of trustees would vote to close three campuses. The speaker and I quickly uh, put out a statement to put an end to that. And I know the Lieutenant Governor uh, also joined that call to say that uh, pulling the rug out from three communities with absolutely no advance warning or a plan for what comes next was insulting to the students, staff, and faculty, uh, and that we needed a more thoughtful approach and a bridge to whatever the future of the system ought to look like. 
but you can only imagine it's like pile that on top of a global pandemic. I would have never suspected the two things happening at once. Mental health services, the last few years, uh, the Scott administration has proposed a grand total of zero dollars for increases in our mental health system, which we know has a uh, major need for rebuilding. We've made substantial increases the last three years, but this has uh, uh, highlighted how much further we have to go. When we see that people who are in prison are now not getting mental health services in the same way they normally would because of the pandemic, when we see how fragile our mental health agencies are, who themselves have had to deal with staffing problems, and yet with all that's going on and the stress and the anxiety, their clients need more services now, and some of them need more acute level of care than normal. And so our appreciation for them, I hope, has grown, and our future resource allocation, I hope, will continue to grow to meet that important need. Um, and then lastly, I'll wrap so we can get to questions. You know, there has been a disparagement of state government that has been a deliberate strategy of ultra wealthy right wingers across the country. And while it's not as direct here in Vermont, we do suffer from some of the same consequences. The fact that we have a Department of Labor computer system that's 30 plus years old, which at least partially explains the absolutely dehumanizing experience many people have had over the last six weeks, uh, is just a sign of what happens when federal policy in particular starves state governments uh, from being able to invest in the kind of infrastructure, both IT and human infrastructure, uh, to be able to meet people's needs when they need it. Uh, this was a Department of Labor disaster that could have been averted uh, with the proper resources from the federal government in particular. Um, and so I think this is also a wake up call about us identifying where those public service cracks are that need to be patched up so we don't have a reenactment. Thank you, Senator. Um, thank you much. Thank you all so much for these great remarks. Um, so now we're going to move on to kind of a question um, answer type part of the program. Um, and we're thrilled to share the voices of adv advocates for many of our frontline workers and most marginalized communities to speak on the issues they are seeing on the ground. To start us off, please welcome Asma Elhuni with Rise Up Va Rise Upper Valley to address the needs of new American and migrant communities. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Okay, um, so my name is Asma Elhuni and I organize in the Upper Valley. Um, and so I think one of the things that is important to point out uh, during this time is that um, yes, everyone is affected by COVID, um, but particularly um, people of color um, who are disadvantaged even further. Um, and so um, when we're talking about uh, how people are disadvantaged, I'm going to focus on immigrants, but I also want to share that this is very much a people of color issue. Um, and so I worry about my siblings that are behind bars and suffering and um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the immigrant community. So uh, there was a stimulus package, the CARES Act, um, which awarded people $1,200. Uh, this package did not include undocumented families and also mixed family status. Um, so if you are undocumented and you have another family member who is a citizen, you still don't get this package. Um, and so what we're seeing is that we are leaving out people who we call essential workers um, yet we're not um, treating them fairly. And so uh, that's one thing. The other thing is people who are undocumented do not get Medicaid and we're asking that um, that Medicaid be expanded to include all members of our community despite or um, uh, despite their immigra immigration status. Um, we're worried about housing with immigrants as well because um, for example, migrant farm workers um, a lot of times are cramped uh, in, in, in locations where they're, they're basically sleeping on top of each other. And so we have vouchers for those who are unhoused. Can we provide vouchers for our um, undocumented uh, immigrant community members as well, particularly farm, farm workers? Also, we're particularly worried about um, policing at this time um, because um, uh, immigrant population is extremely visible. 
And so we're worried about racial profiling. And so we'd like to see something done about it. So I guess my question would be, um, we would like um, uh, a lot of the immigrant uh, population that the state of Vermont allocate a sum of money um, to address people of color issues. Um, and one way that could go uh, would be part of that would address the, um, the imbalance of, of um, providing um, stimulus packages, particularly the $1,200, uh, but also address the many other issues that I just mentioned now that um, this kind of allocating of money um, that we just received one point to $5 billion, it's, it's just extremely important that we're allocating some of that money to people of color issues. Okay, is there, um, is one of you like to take this question or respond? Well, I'll start with the unfortunate, one unfortunate aspect, which is the parameters of that 1.2 billion and I suspect that the speaker and the senator may be able to give more details although we're really all just beginning to learn them. Uh, the administration just started talking about some of the guidelines they were given today and there are a lot of restrictions on how that money can be used. Uh, I know initially what we heard was that it could only be used to cover new expenses that were brought on to the state to address sort of the, the health crisis and any uh, ramifications from it. Uh, certainly many of us, I think, could be creative in broadening what that definition is. I, for instance, have a question around uh, broadband. And if we have a third of the state not getting good education, that's a cost of COVID would be to provide broadband. My guess is that won't really fall into the window of use. Similarly, uh, I think a lot of what you brought up um, asthma may may also be not permitted, um, but I would hope that the governor would be looking to be as creative uh, and push the federal government and work with other governors to push the federal government to allow as broad a use of those revenues as possible for some of those issues that you just brought up. Um, I'd say as a whole, we're really just at the beginning of it, and maybe the speaker and the, and the pro tem have a deeper knowledge, but I think even they are still trying to start peeling that back. Is that fair? Speaker, do you wanna? Yeah, can I just um, add sure. something? Oh, I would sorry. say, yes, uh, in, terms of the, in terms of a lot of federal dollars, there are, there are tremendous uh, restrictions because of a lot of the racism that the federal government has continued to institutionalize. Um, we, we, have, we do have uh, some flexibility with state dollars and we're just trying to figure out um, what we have in terms of those resources right now. Um, uh, the House on our last day in session passed a resolution um, trying to take a step towards protecting undocumented workers if they um, if they were to, uh, to go to a health care facility so that the house has taken a pretty strong stand um, preventing uh, just making a statement saying that um, undocumented workers um, and 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 immigrants should not be targeted in any way if they go to seek health care that's you know the best for for those individuals and um, obviously all of us to make sure that anybody can seek health care. Um, uh, I'll have to look into the, um, in terms of being able to have undocumented workers on Medicaid, there are federal restrictions on, on who, can, um, who can be part of Medicaid because it's a federal state partnership, but I'm happy to look into that. And in terms of, in terms of undocumented workers receiving the $1,200 stimulus, here we are caught in this very vicious catch-22 where the $1,200 went to people who had applied for unemployment, but their applications hadn't gone through yet. Um, but if they're undocumented, they haven't, they, they, they may not have paid in uh, or they, to, um, you know, to the unemployment system. Some of them might have, some of them might not have. And if they're not in the system, um, 
we're going to have trouble finding them to connect with resources. So would um, probably would love help from from a lot of the communities that in Vermont um, that that work with people that you know that aren't aren't as much in the um, sort of government databases as others. I, I don't need to weigh in for a third one if you wanted to get more questions in, but I do see that Asma sent info about California and New Jersey, so we can check that out. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor and Speaker Johnson and Senator Ash. I would like to next introduce Mark Hughes, um, who's with us from the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance to address some of the needs of communities of color in Vermont. Thank you, Jubilee, and uh, shout out to the uh, Lieutenant Governor and the uh, um, Speaker and uh, uh, Pro Tem and uh, the Whole Rights of Democracy team. I've been asked to speak, as you just heard, uh, for nearly over 28,000 people, uh, and uh, you've heard uh, one of those segments of folks that uh, uh, Esme just brought uh, forward, and I just want to lift that up because it's a similar message and um, it, it is an economic discussion. Um, I would say without having folks like uh, Vermonters for Justice in Palestine or um, folks like Black Lives Matter and Rutland and Wyndham NAACP folks and AALV and Migrant Justice and the Root Social Justice Center, uh, Partners for Fairness and Diversity, I Am Vermont too, um, the Vermont Coalition for Ethnic and Social Equity in Schools, um, it's really not a complete discussion. Uh, and so I've, I'm already tasked with an in, impossible uh, t uh, assignment, uh, but I'm gonna just give it a shot. And I would think that maybe uh, some of what I'm gonna say, uh, they, maybe some of those folks might echo some of the concerns that I'll bring forward. The uh, Racial Justice Alliance is, is a, um, you know, we have a steering committee here of about 20 people of color. Uh, and we meet weekly to check in on discussions and concerns uh, that surface in our communities. Um, economics is the heart of the challenges faced by Vermont people of color. Hard stop. Uh, Pre-COVID-19, uh, Black people uh, had an unemployment rate of two times that of, uh, of whites. And there, there was also a median wealth gap of one in 13, in other words, the median wealth of a black family is one thirteenth that of a white family pre-COVID. Um, many were pre-unemployed uh, pre uh, with no benefits whatsoever, um, underemployed, entrepreneurially progressing, uh, previously incarcerated or under the control of the correction system, unbanked, or had no sufficient tax or fi uh, tax filing history. And uh, I just read somewhere last week that the Center uh, for Responsible Lending estimated that upwards of about 90% of businesses owned by people of co uh, color have been or will likely be shut out of the PPP program. As uh, Speaker Johnson just mentioned in terms of the racist policy that's coming from the top. <clears throat> It's important to note that COVID-19 has amplified um, all of the social, uh, political, racial, and economic fissures that exist in Vermont. Uh, now please recall the, uh, the Attorney General and the Human Rights Commission's Act 54, their Racial Disparities in State Systems Report and Recommendations that's dated 15 December 2017, uh, which highlighted racial disparities across state systems of government. Uh, COVID-19 is severely exacerbating all of the known disparities across housing, education, employment, health services access, and the justice system. Now, time doesn't permit me to uh, share the specifics or discuss the pain and the fear of the many people of color here in Vermont, uh, but these fears are rooted in real impact uh, up to and including um, higher chances of contracting as well as dying from the virus. Uh, I'll conclude with saying that Act 54, the report suggested as a strategy, quote, Vermont state government will devote sufficient resources to reducing identified racial disparities 
across all systems of state government. Vermont should set aside 10% of the COVID-19 funds to address the severe impact of people of color here. A targeted stimulus and economic development package should be provided to assist those who have not otherwise been helped and provided targeted employment uh, development, transition assistance, or reentry assistance. Some of these funds should be used for education technology and family advocacy assistance and for paid uh, you, uh, and for utility and rent accruals, accruals uh, post, uh, post COVID-19. So this funding, it should also uh, proactively fund the expansion of the Office of Racial Equity uh, with policy and training, uh, data analytics and, and outreach capabilities to ensure that we continue to address the underlying structural and institutional contributors that are multiplying COVID-19 impact and the impact of the next crisis. We can't go back to the same. My question, and I'll, I'll just share one, is, is what will you do to ensure there is a high priority placed on COVID-19 resource allocation for the implementation of people of color targeted stimulus and economic development packages, um, which also includes employment development transition assistance and reentry, given our vulnerability, and when will we see these results? Thank you. Well, I'm, Tanya, I'm happy to start off since I took a pass on the last one. Thank you. Um, no, and thanks, as always, Mark, for the comprehensive sort of summary statement of where things have been, where we are, and where you think working with peers we ought to go. Um, you know, I think I can speak for the Senate to make sure that we use the resources in ways that don't uh, exacerbate the structural problems we already have, but work towards improving things. And the particular, one of the particular areas of emphasis, and for those of you who don't know, uh, I actually met Mark working on the Senate, in the Senate Judiciary Committee when he was a lone voice at one point uh, talking about the importance of data collection in traffic stops. Um, and the um, issue of equity in hiring in state government and a number of other topics. Um, and right now, we, we were, before COVID-19, we were about halfway through the process of taking a second big bite at our criminal justice system, the first one in 15 years or so. Uh, we were calling it Justice Reinvestment Two. I think you can piece together. It's because there was another one done before. And we had a, tar a goal of making sure that we could eliminate our use of out-of-state prisons within a fairly short period of time, uh, and that we could use the savings from the dollars that otherwise go to Corrections Corporation of America, or whatever the heck they call it now, to provide resources to actually do transitional housing, more treatment, treatment in the community, get people the training they need so that they can successfully be in the community and not be under correction supervision. Well, that is actually being actively taken up in the House now, even now during this crisis, so people can uh, tune into those uh, House uh, corrections and institutions proceedings. But the other bit of information I wanna share is that during this crisis, we have reduced the number of people who are behind bars in Vermont by, I. I want to say somewhere between three and 400 people. Now, the question then is, when we're through the crisis, what happens then? Do we just fill the beds right back up? Or do we learn from the experience and try to dig even deeper uh, to reduce the number of people in our prison beds? So my answer to Mark and the whole group is that that is going to be one particular place that I place a lot of my personal emphasis on, on behalf of the Senate. Um, another area, it speaks to uh, a different um, aspect of the new American community. Uh, but last year we passed a series of measures to try to really allow our new American community to fulfill their potential here in Vermont and to get employers to understand that this is that the diversity that our new Americans bring to the workforce is a strength, not, not an irritant, not something that's hard to overcome, but something to celebrate and that can actually make uh, employers more successful. And so that's another area that I think um, often goes under appreciated when we talk about economic development and good paying jobs, but something that I'm really committed to. 
Tim, can I ask you to see if you can get uh, Jim Baker to release the race demographics of the current prison population and those who were released because we don't see them. The numbers who have been released during the crisis, you mean? Yes, sir. I will get on that. I also want to commend whoever it is in this audience, because I'm suspecting some of the people here may have been the reason why we are now um, collecting and communicating the race data for those who have been uh, tested positive or been hospitalized, which is now easily accessible. Uh, but that probably wouldn't have happened had it not been for advocacy. We're still working on it. Thank you, Senator Ash. Uh, yeah, thank you all for, um, for talking and thank you, Mark Hughes, for that. Um, up next, please welcome Sarah Launderville of the Vermont Center for Independent Living to address the needs of individuals with disabilities in our community. Hi, sorry, I was yelling at my kids to turn off Alexa <laughs> right no as you muted me. <laughs> we might get some music, so thanks so much um, for having me on the call today. Um, wow, it's been... <laughs> It's been a world when the last, I can't even um, think of dates anymore, but um, I just wanna give you sort of some highlights of what we've been seeing um, at the Vermont Center for Independent Living. First of all, a huge spike in our Meals on Wheels program. Almost immediately, people who, um, to be eligible for Meals on Wheels, um, for, for us, you have to have a disability, not be able to prepare your own meal. And there are lots of people with disabilities who can prepare their own meals, typically but all of a sudden they couldn't. They couldn't get to the grocery store. They had to really stay in shelter in place because of the underlying health conditions. And so life had tr drastically changed. And so having access to food has become sort of that number one thing that we've been um, really looking at. Um, and, and looking further into folks who are eligible for Meals on Wheels, but also just people having access to groceries, to being able to go shopping, um, to be able to have somebody help deliver. Um, EBT benefits, SNAP benefits are not accessible to people online. They're just not. And so we have a huge problem around that system. Um, we heard a huge amount of um, conversation from the deaf community around not having access to um, American Sign Language interpreters um, on a large level um, scale. And I, I'm happy now our governor is um, during press conferences, having an ASL interpreter every time, and that the um, news media is actually broadcasting the interpreter the entire time. So that's really important to us. But also as, as we look to systems and how we're really getting information out, we should really be um, looking at making sure that there's captioning on Zoom calls or um, having uh, information at, in plain language or a fourth grade reading level with pictures. So that really helps people understand about the seriousness. When our peer advocate counselors went out in the community, we found overwhelming amount of people who just didn't even understand how in, um, important this um, information uh, was around COVID-19. They didn't think it was a big deal because they didn't have access to computers. They don't have access to the television. So they don't have access to that information. We also saw a large amount of people who are homeless who um, were going deeper into the woods because all of a sudden there are more helpers out there. And so with all of these people who um, want to help, we wanted to see some direction and, and I appreciate the work that's being done um, around volunteer communities, but at the same time, in time really taking a step back and deciding if you actually have that expertise or not around some of um, the skill set because we were actually driving people who are homeless deeper into the woods. Um, we, we've seen a spike in calls around um, mental health and providing peer-to-peer -peer services around mental health um, services overall. Our um, agribility program is a program that helps farmers um, continue to farm after having a disability so we usually will connect people with assistive technology that sorts of things but um, suicide and um, inf information about mental health services is something that we are really trying to connect people on, um, especially farmers in our community who have disabilities. Um, the final two things um, are, we have a lot of um, worry about how special education is being administered in our state right now. Um, it's, you know, everybody is really doing the best they can. I have three <laughs> kids here um, and I understand fully how teachers are trying to respond to this, but our special educators and our administrators are having um, a really difficult time around how do we make sure that we're truly providing those supports and services that need to happen. Um, 
and then finally, um, medical rationing. We've seen some changes in language, thankfully, um, from UVM around how we're not going to ration the use of ventilators just because somebody has a disability. But I think that that's something that needs to be on the forefront. So my, my question, thank you for <laughs> letting me get in all that, um, uh, is around these EBT um, benefits and SNAP benefits. And our federal delegation encouraged um, DCF to apply and become a, a pilot state to allow for online SNAP purchases because other um, several other states have been allowed to do this. And DCF does not want to apply because it would take too much time. So my question is, can you help me get that done? Thank you. Does anyone want, go ahead, Speaker Johnson. I'm happy to jump in and, uh, and see about, uh, you know, rope in my appropriate committee chairs to see if they can um, push that forward and if we could connect on, on some more details uh, on that. We are, you know, we're always looking for ways to um, expand eligibility of programs to make sure that, to make sure that we're creating the best safety net we can. I would briefly add, uh, but yeah, also, uh, Shay, I think Senator Ash got muted again, so you might want to unmute him. He's trying to raise <laughs> his hand, but <laughs> you've silenced him. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that's important, I, I mentioned earlier about the limits of the COVID money, and I saw Asma's comment, you know, that's not enough, and I appreciate that. Um, the, there is a reality that Vermont is the, the poorest state in New England. Uh, and, but at the same time, there are a lot of Vermonters, uh, I would argue, that are at the higher end of the spectrum who are willing to pay more. Uh, Richard Snelling, a Republican governor uh, in the early 90s when resources were tight, um, promoted a temporary marginal income tax increase on the wealthiest to uh, help the economy when times were bad in the early 90s. Uh, and so I would say, you know, coming out of this pandemic, we really have an opportunity to say, well, as we rebuild, and I suspect there will be other monies coming from the feds, uh, besides Mitch McConnell, I think Republican and Democratic governors are saying, we're gonna need money. Um, that the rebuild money, one of the big questions over the next year or two is how is that going to be used? Is it going to be to just sort of rebuild the way it was, or is it gonna be rebuilding in a way with some vision related to so far, all three of these uh, folks questions in terms of investing in that, that infrastructure or those opportunities that include, you know, all the different injustices being maybe not made right, because I think, you know, we're looking at centuries of, of wrong, but, uh, but moving towards right, investing in whether it's education issues, whether it's, uh, criminal justice, uh, prison reform, and so forth, and investing in those folks so they have those economic opportunities of the future and, and putting all that wealth inequality that Mark was talking about, putting those educational inequities together that Sarah was talking about uh, into that. But I think we're still in the, we don't know what money is going to come, but what can we also augment with at the state level? It's not all going to be federal. Thank you. Senator Ash, have you been unmuted? I, I have, I think. Uh, and I guess it, I know that, uh, Sarah, that DCF, I thought was moving forward, but it's so it's somewhat news to me that they have come up with the reason to not uh, continue to seal the deal with the feds. I, I've heard from constituents as well who can't safely leave home and want to be able to purchase from the grocery store. <laughs> so we'll follow up um, to see where things stand with that. Thank you. That's an issue I've heard a lot about in my community as well. So thank you everyone for weighing in on that. And thank you, Sarah, for bringing that up. I would like to introduce next Deb Snell of the Vermont Federation of Nurses to address the needs of our frontline healthcare workers. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Deb Snell. I represent 1,800 nurses at the UVM Medical Center and 300 technical professionals. Um, and I would first of all like to thank everyone for all their shout outs and caring about the healthcare workers that are on the front lines. I work in the medical ICU and I have been taking care of these patients. And I can tell you, it's been heartbreaking having <clears throat> not having family members there when someone's dying. 
it's been horrible. But what I want to talk about is, first of all, the PPE situation in our state right now. We understand that um, the governor and our hospitals are telling us we have enough PPE, but I'm concerned about the quality of PPE that we have available. I know at Birchwood um, Nursing Home, they had a serious, serious outbreak. In fact, 14 patients there died last week. Um, and what we are hearing is they had gowns made of paper and gloves that were tearing. You can't care for someone like that. It's just horrible. And, you know, these are the people we're supposed to be protecting and we can't take care of these people unless we're taking care of ourselves first. So that's just, and I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. It's been a rough week. Um, but anyway, um, so I'm concerned about people getting not only the enough PPE, but the proper PPE. Um, I'm concerned about our hospitals closing down. I'm concerned about our small community hospitals because we're going to lose nurses. We're going to lose doctors. We already have shortages of primary care physicians. We already have shortages of nurses. And now we're going to have shortages of hospitals. And that is beyond scary in our state that we are facing such an impact on this. I'm also very concerned about the immunocompromised staff that we have. We have nurses, we have all kinds of healthcare providers that have chronic illnesses that have no guarantee that they would not be put in a situation to take care of one of these patients. And there's, it's, it's beyond uncomprehensible to me that our hospital would put us in that <clears throat> position. But the question that I really want to ask is, you know, we're hearing, you know, we have a great trend going here in our state, but there is a better than 50% chance this is gonna come back this winter and it's gonna be horrible. And what is our state preparing to do for a potential second wave of this pandemic? Thank you, Deb, for sharing that and for asking that really important question. Who would like to start with an answer. Speaker Johnson. Sure. Um, Deb, thank you for, for, for speaking up to all of us about what you're seeing on the front lines. Thank you for the work that you're doing and thank, please pass on our, our gratitude to all of the people you work with. Um, at, the, at the start of all of this crisis, uh, when when the the leaders here on the call were were on the phone with the governor, our um, you know our first thoughts were we've we've got to make sure that healthcare has what they need because you you don't you don't have a lot of time when somebody needs oxygen they 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 need it quickly um, and and so making sure that we have the right equipment is really critical. Um, I at this point I know the. Um, there's a lot of discussion about how do we make sure to keep um, keep tracking infection rates uh, and keep tracking how how wide open we open the economy so that um, you know so that we don't wind up with a, a significant second wave. Um, I think that's where we're hitting a lot of frustration mm -hmm. from from some people wanting you know we. All of us get emails every day from some other sector, from some other business, from some other, you know, type of worker saying, so this would be great if you could include us in the next round, or how about crews of 10 instead of five? Um, and and we, keep, we keep trying to push back and define those health parameters uh, to say, this is, it's the, it's the health data that is really trying to govern um, a lot of those decisions. And so I, I, I applaud, Governor Scott for kind of the steady work that he's doing there. I think um, uh, I think I think at, at this point, you know, we have been we've been so heads down and trying to deal with um, sort of the the day and the week right in front of us. I think the question you ask is a really critical one that that I think we'll be able to try to address, you know, just within a couple of weeks about 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 those stockpiles, about what happens, um, you know, what happens in, in terms of us being prepared for, um, for the next 
for the next for the next phase for the next surge um it's it's very uh disheartening and really disturbing to to hear how um you know how poor the quality of some of the PPE is, particularly in a community that is so vulnerable. Um, and this is this is where a a complete absence of federal leadership is uh, is is really causing more loss of life than it needs to in this country. We have mm -hmm. governors that are outbidding each other on eBay, effectively, um, to see who can get the most for their state. Uh, when when this is where we really need a coordinated federal response uh, to actually act as a group of United States um, and and so the uh, you know I, I it felt a little bit nuts but I'm I'm passing along to members of the administration and to uh, and to healthcare leaders um, these these crazy emails that I'm getting saying you know offering PPE here to buy um, and that feel a lot like, that feel a lot like, a, a, you know, some sort of invitation for somebody's will from some sort of prince somewhere. But, but I'm, I'm willing to keep passing them along just, just so that there are some leads. Um, if there are ways that you can think of to, to create better, um, to create better standards for things that are purchased or better checking, I am all open. Um, but the, this is a this is a terrible, terrible situation that you're describing. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Yeah. Do either of the other two of you want to weigh in um, some as to what the plan is for the next wave of this? Because all of the statistics and and information at this point shows that it isn't over. Tim, you want to go first? Go ahead, Dave. Uh, well, I just want to say a couple things. Um, I really appreciate the speaker's comments, but it brings to mind some of the background conversations I've had with Dr. Levine and others uh, about the way things are presented by the administration in terms of PPE. We've talked a lot about masks, but they really didn't talk a lot about these other aspects of PPE in terms of the, the shortage and desperation, the situation that, that Deb just expressed. Uh, I do think going forward, one of the differences, and I think even the governor spoke to it today, is that if there's another rise in the future as, as the things get opened up a little bit, there will have been more time to accumulate, one would think, the appropriate PPE, which obviously we have not done. Um, and, and time is what I think is certainly at the very beginning was one of the biggest uh, factors going into the last six weeks that we went through. But listening to the words of, of leadership and really hearing what they're saying, and then maybe Deb and others helping us with information that reveals where that's not really telling the whole story, the more the public hears the whole story, the more pressure there is on all of us, including the administration, to address those issues that I think most of the public doesn't even know are quite as bad as what you just expressed. And that's what organizing is about. That's what obviously this group is all about. Because um, that is incredibly frustrating uh, to hear. And Deb, I'd just say one of the things that I have not been happy with, with our Department of Labor and our Department of Health, to be frank, you know, we're, we're all trying to stay positive because we need people's morale to be high and keep making the best decisions. If I were to single out one area of definite disagreement has been the kind of ignoring of this issue that you just posed. You could have two nurses side by side at Birchwood, one employed by UVM Medical Center with appropriate gowns and masks and shields, and then one that happens to be employed by whoever owns Birchwood Terrace in inadequate uh, materials, which may actually be known to not safeguard against the virus. And so, we have state labor laws which are meant to protect people in the workforce from known, you know, carcinogens, you know, and other things that pose a risk to, to worker health. And it seems to me to be uh, rather uh, hands off to say that who your employer is is going to de determine whether you're going to be safe or not. Another instance which drives me really batty right now is grocery store uh, workers. We were on the Commissioner of Health to require 
that everyone wear a mask, not just the workers, but all who enter into the grocery stores. They have been unwilling to do that for customers, and they only recently did it after five weeks for the employees themselves. So I think that's one of the lessons that we have to take out of this is, are we going to be serious about protecting people regardless of who employs them? And we, we don't, I mean, we're doing it on the fly in a sense because we don't know what the next few months will look like. But if, let's say things die down a bit, if it takes four months and it starts picking up and we haven't rectified that kind of situation you've just described, then we're all, all accountable for that. Thank you all. Um, up next, we would like to welcome Linda Olson uh, from the Vermont State Colleges and AFT, and she is here to address the needs of state college employees. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm also a faculty member at Castleton and have been for the past 25 years, and I'm still a little worked up from Deb's emotional um, uh, speech, and I really appreciate the difficulty that she and others are going through right now and appreciate their good work. Um, I know that uh, the, the speaker and Senator Ash are probably up to their eyeballs in Vermont State Colleges right now. I know that's been sort of something that's consumed your very uh, being. So I won't, I won't bother you with the details because I think you know, you understand um, what situation we find ourselves in. What I do want to say is that when the economy is bad, people go back to school. Um, they learn a new profession or they learn a new trade. Those who have lost their jobs due to COVID-19 could shelter in place at one of the Vermont State Colleges. We could retool the majors or certificates available at these colleges to focus on those areas the state needs. More nurses, mental health health care professionals, public health professionals, dental hygien hygienists, construction workers, tradespeople. If the state would invest in the colleges, they would get a return on that investment. I'm hearing all these people speak today and I just see education as being at the heart of everything else. And if we would invest properly in our education system, we could solve a lot of these other problems that have been brought up, like racism, providing um, nurses for a nursing shortage. Um, I would like to uh, see us do this and really invest in our public higher education in a way that we can have a dramatic um, result on our state and that um, the state colleges and UVM could be the heart of the recovery for uh, COVID-19. Um, so what I'm asking for is um, $25 million for the bridge funding to get us through the next year so we can make a reasonable plan uh, for the colleges going forward. I think you have an appreciation of the value of our colleges, uh, much more so it would seem than our chancellor. So I'm hoping that you will give us the resources to figure out our path forward. Um, I think we would also need, and we are also asking for a significant increase in appropriations going forward. Because as you know, um, we, are, we rank 49th or 50th, depending on which figure you look at in the nation for state appropriations for higher education. Um, and I think it's time that we invest and make public higher education central to our recovery, central to our economy, and that we really invest in something that will make our state better and will keep our young people here. I think it's a solution to a lot of problems we're hearing about. Um, so, uh, and I also, one other thing, I also would like to see um, the faculty and staff be central in this process as well as student voices. Um, so that's what I'm asking for going forward and I'm hoping you can give some insight into what you've been talking about when it comes to the Vermont State Colleges lately. Speaker, do you wanna? Sure, sure. Um, just wanted to give an opportunity. I jumped in on the last one. Um, so uh, yes, we have had been having a, quite a, a lot of conversations. It was, it was a tremendous shock to all of us as well when the chancellor, uh, where are we? The days blur together. I think we're up to 10 days ago. Um, made an announcement saying that three campuses would close and then five or six days after that said, nope, guess not, um, which has, you know, left everybody in this horribly uncertain place. Uh, I think, you know, the, there, there would have been so many good opportunities to, 
to have so much engagement beforehand and and try to figure out transition plans uh, beforehand. Um, so the, our next steps um, to to work on this, which um, the uh, Senator Ash and I are are working on right now, are um, in broad strokes to uh, to get an independent financial assessment to see how much money is needed. Um, I know the you know the chancellor is saying 25 million dollars and so we just want to make sure that an independent assessment is the same thing because um there's there are issues with the level of trust there and and how reliable information is coming out of the office there. um speaking for myself personally um uh and and i am um, i'm hoping that we can engage the, the affected campuses, uh, the board of trustees, um, whomever to, um, to, to come forward with, with an operating plan for the fall that we can invest in. Uh, at this point, there's, um, we're trying to explore where money could come from um, because right, again, right now, we're hearing some feedback from the administration that the administration doesn't believe that the, that the COVID-19 money can be used for that. Um, any COVID expenses, yes, but if the COVID expenses involve a, a loss of revenue or a drop in business um, for, uh, you know, for, for other entities or a loss of students um, because of COVID, then, then that money can't be used for that. So we're, we're, we're looking into exploring where we can come up with that amount of money in the midst of a financial crisis. Um, and I think there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people interested in having a robust conversation this summer and fall with all stakeholders, not just from the Vermont State Colleges, but um, but with other higher ed institutions and um, and other communities that that aren't currently able to access higher ed, and with our um, employers and the workforce about what does Vermont need from higher ed. Um, what are our workforce needs? Wh who are the people that are not being served uh, logistically, financially, geographically, and uh, and how can we create um, a much more robust 21st century higher education system moving forward? Um, but to do that, I, I do believe we need a transition year because if we just pull the rug out from under those three campuses, um, it really cuts off a lot of our future options. Thank you. Just one of you, we're getting kind of down to the wire time-wise, but um, do either of you want to weigh in, Senator? If you're, if you're wanting to move on, we can move on. Otherwise, I can follow. Oh, I think we have time uh, for yeah. one more person. And we may just go, I hope people will stay on just so we can give all of our, um, uh, you know, all of the organizations who have joined us here tonight proper time for their questions. So we may go about 10 minutes over, but well, please continue. I was gonna throw something brief on there, which is um, Senator Ash and Speaker Johnson were really quick on Sunday to put out a letter. Uh, the governor had followed up. I was uh, had been announcing and was on a, a conference press call when uh, you know the board you know said they were gonna delay the vote. Um, so I just have to say that the the speed with which there was an organic grassroots movement around the Vermont State Colleges in my 20 plus years in office was bigger and faster than anything else I had ever seen. Every other issue we've worked on with many people on this call around wages, around healthcare, people supported it, but it took time to build it. 25,000 signatures in a very short window of time was just unbelievable. People are still organizing and working well. Linda, thank you, and Mary Collins, and you know Tom Luce, and students. Um, and so I do think the pressure on is good and keep it on. I would also say that we have an incredible sort of strange opportunity because of the pandemic, which is that after 9-11, a lot of people in those urban areas thought about maybe not living in those urban areas anymore. And I do think over these next few years, there's gonna be a lot of people looking at places like Vermont from our South going, maybe living up there or maybe going to school up there is the better place to go than a massive university in the middle of a big city. So I think there's a lot of, strange opportunity created by the situation right now. Absolutely. Thank you. Senator Ash, did you want to weigh I, in? At, oh, okay, thank I, you. I, I would love to, but let's move on to the next topic. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. You're absolutely right. We do have an opportunity to really build something for the people. Um, up next, please welcome David Van Dusen, the AFL-CIO president, to address the needs of essential workers across our state. Hi. Glad to be here with you all today. Uh, as you all may already be aware, members, our 10,000 members and their families are struggling right now, and they're scared. They're scared about infection. They're scared about their family, their uh, high-risk folks in their families getting sick, but they're also scared about what comes next. In the crisis that we are facing now, clearly is fast uh, become an economic crisis. So in the 1930s, when we saw unemployment levels uh, approaching these the heights that we have now, there was a robust response from government. I would like to ask you all right now how you envision the recovery. Are you committed to rebuilding Vermont's economy through a union-based Green New Deal, one whereby there is public investment in renewable energy inf uh, infrastructure and other make-work programs? and through which union workers will be employed and paid prevailing wages. Likewise, uh, through such a union-based Green New Deal, are you committed to rethinking our social contract, whereby all working people have a right to public health care, paid family medical leave, free college tuition, and the freedom to form a union through card check? Thank you. Who would like to start off with an answer to that? I'll offer just the brief response because that was about 12 different questions all bundled carefully into one, um, which is, I'll look back to the recession, which someone pointed out was another calamity during my lifetime, although that happened over a period of multiple years. This one happened within a period of about three days. Um, so a little bit different in that regard. Um, we do not yet know what resources we're going to have to work with. And there will be many who say use state policies in terms of taxes and things to generate the kind of money. But I think for what, David, you just described, the kind of substantial reinvigoration of a middle class uh, and working class is going to be dependent on massive amounts of federal money. And so if the question is, will we use federal money to uh, boost our green economy in ways that we have not been able to do with existing resources, I think you'll find us committed to doing that. If it's to boost the vitality and educational equity that comes with broadband to areas that are underserved with these resources, I think you will find that we're committed to doing that. I think continuing uh, to increase the wages of many of the people who we have, you know, we have discussed uh, tonight, um, absolutely committed to doing that. Uh, and so it's hard to say uh, yes to 12 substantial overhauls of our society, because uh, I'm not gonna make like a light promise about some hugely substantial changes. But I think the general thrust of your point about using the large resources that will come to bear to harness and reinvigorate, whether it's a green economy, working class, middle class, then absolutely we're committed to doing that. And, and I just want to add, I mean, I think some of that will be in the next six weeks or whatever length of time the senator and the speaker think the legislature is going to continue on because obviously we're going to go much later than we normally do. But uh, a lot more of it will probably be in the January, February, March of the next session, um, would be my guess. Uh, and so organizing as you do um, is gonna be a big piece of who the decision makers are that put the parameters around the use of that money, uh, the, the parameters around businesses that might receive that money. You know, The state gives out a lot of tax credits and other incentives to businesses, well, what did you do or what do you do to protect your workers in this situation uh, and so forth. Those are, those are the laws that the legislators all over this call um, and governor and lieutenant governor promote or don't promote. Thank you. 
all. Um, and so finally, we would like to welcome Eric Evelson of Vermont Legal Aid to address the needs of Vermonters interfacing with our state systems. Good evening, my name is Eric Avildsen. I want everybody to know that although it, almost everybody at Legal Aid is working from home and we're not meeting clients in our offices, we are still helping a lot of Vermonters. Calls to our hotlines are up over 50% and we're now getting 500 calls a week. 3,000 individual Vermonters visited our website last week alone. We've posted a lot of information there about questions related to the pandemic. And uh, that website is VT Law Help vtlawhelp.org. Um, we have links there to videos of our own town halls. Uh, we had one recently on unemployment compensation, uh, the law around it, and uh, how to solve some of the most common problems. Similarly, with, we had a uh, town hall the week before on the stimulus check on your taxes, on how it interfaces with benefits. Our next one is this Thursday, the 29th, uh, at, at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, finally, tomorrow, we're holding a virtual legal clinic for people over 60 uh, from 9 to 11. So go to the website uh, to learn how to register uh, to set up an appointment with the lawyer if you're over 60 tomorrow. Um, you can apply for help from Legal Aid right on the website, as well as get the uh, phone, phone numbers for our two hotlines, one for general legal assistance and one for healthcare problems. I know Mitzi and Tim have already been hearing from Legal Aid attorneys about the need not only for an eviction moratorium, but on how to manage the lifting of that moratorium. We need to take affirmative steps to avoid, to prevent the wholesale eviction of every Vermonter who's behind on their rent. Uh, we also need and have been working on how to avoid returning 1,500 people who are to, back to homelessness who are now sheltered in hotels. Uh, finally, I want to focus on some of Vermont's most vulnerable citizens, the poorest of our low-income neighbors, those with disabilities, and those who don't speak English. Many of the lowest-income Vermonters relied on, rely on TANF and SNAP, yet the stimulus did not include any additional money for those programs. Vermonters need an ex equitable distribution of education funding that takes into account the COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated the barriers to a free and appropriate public education for students face for students with disabilities. And finally, the Department of Labor and other state agency websites are rarely translated into other languages. And we know that getting through two agencies by telephone is really challenging. We are concerned that Vermonters with limited English proficiency will not be able to access the benefits and understand what's available to them from the state. Um, so we ask that pressure be brought to bear on the administration to do more with respect to translation. Thank you. Um, I just want to briefly say, I know there's uh, some great folks. Allison Cigar has been putting together a lot of translation videos. Um, obviously, not everybody has access to videos, and it shouldn't be on everyday citizens to be putting those together. So I appreciate your remarks with respect to uh, the government doing some of that. Um, I would also add um, Muhammad Jafar has been doing a lot of work with uh, newamericans.org, which I think has a number of translations specifically around COVID, but obviously it reveals a lot of the other inequities of access to information um, that new Americans and folks where English is not their primary language have, whether it's the healthcare situation with COVID-19, but then it's also economic opportunities, educational opportunities, housing inequities, uh, and so forth. Um, I do see at some of our FQHCs, particularly, you know, in the Old North End of Burlington, signs up that have a fair number of languages and translations, but I'm sure they still come up short, but they've been working hard to do that as well. Um, and there you go. Thank you for putting that website up, uh, Rights Democracy. Go ahead, Speaker Johnson. I would just add that the, um, I believe the, the rental um, eviction moratorium and foreclosure moratorium bill uh, recently passed the end of last week out of the general housing military affairs in the house. It's already been passed in the Senate. Um, and so we'll be taking that up on the floor this week and hopefully finalizing that and wrapping that up. I'd just like to uh, put a, perhaps a, a additional layer of info on Eric with the issue you described about 1500 people who are homeless or essentially homeless 
and how they transition once the pandemic's over. For those of you who are less familiar um, with this housing issue, um, people have been located to motels largely and some hotels all across the state so that they could be safely um, separated from others. Um, we know our homeless shelters often are very tight, uh, confined spaces with a higher risk of spreading infection. And housing providers throughout the state working with legal aid and others are saying now's the time actually to learn a lot from these 1500 individuals and think about how we can successfully partner or support them um, to move as many people out of homelessness as possible and figure out what are those barriers because we're learning a lot more about them now than we do under normal circumstances. So I think both housing committees uh, in the House and Senate are uh, hearing from the coalition of affordable housing organizations to figure out what that might look like. Uh, and we'll work and push the governor's team to figure out how we can bring some dollars to bear to help out. So thanks, Eric, for, for bringing that up. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we're gonna go back to Kaya. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> I want to thank everyone so much. Thank you so, so much. What a powerful and incredible session. Uh, this was so needed, and I'm so grateful for each of you coming and being a part of this really, really. <laughs> Really key dialogue right now. A huge thank you to our legislative leadership for joining us today, um, taking the time out of your busy weeks to be a part of this, and for each of you contributing so much to this important conversation. Each of the advocates who spoke today from their heart, from their constituencies, and those um, who are learning more about what we're facing right now. So please be sure to visit Right to Democracy on our website. You can find us again on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube for more events and information. And we will be posting this up after the event and we'll send out some links and other information that's come from today. Thank you so, so, so much to all of you. Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you and together we win. Have a great night. Thank you.